We're in verse 17, and we spend a great deal of time talking about this wonderful verse that we've used a thousand times, I'm sure, and maybe more. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. This statement that says new creature is not saying that we ought to be a new creature or that we should be trying to be a new creature, but that we are a new creature. We're not trying to become one. We ought not to be trying to become one. We are, according to this scripture, a new creature. It is saying this new man is a new creature. If a person is not a new creature, he is not in Christ. It, the new creature, means evidently that there is a change produced in the renewed heart of man that is equivalent to the act of creation and that bears a strong resemblance to it, a change, so to speak, as if the man made over again and had become new. That a change is produced so great as to make it proper to say that he is a new man. He has new views, new motives, new principles, new objects, and plans of life. He seeks new purposes, and he lives for new ends. All of that last little part was from Albert Barnes, and I think he described it very well. One of the greatest, and I'm going to take a little deviation. I mentioned this last Wednesday night, but one of the greatest motivations, and I asked last Wednesday night, what motivates you? Is it uh, these things, new views that we're talking about as a new creature? Does those things motivate you, or does something else motivate you? And I brought up probably one of the most uh, basic and primary motivators in our society, and that motivation that is so prevalent is money. That is the greatest motivator that I know of right now in the society in which we live. It may not be for everybody, but there are a lot of people who are motivated by money. You and I both know what the Lord Jesus said. By the way, a new creature has new views and a new creature is not going to be motivated by money, even though sometimes we succumb to that. Should the new creature have the motivation of just making money? No. The Bible says, and Jesus said it in Luke 16, 13, no servant can serve two masters for either he will hate the one and love the other or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Now listen to this illustration. It's unusual. And I'll tell you why it's unusual in just a minute. Last night in the Bible Institute, Brother Yates quickly covered a parable, this co the parable from that verse, and the lessons on the life of Christ. Now you probably remember the parable, it was on the steward. And the steward has not been very faithful with his master's money, and so he's going to get fired. And since he's going to get fired, he thinks to himself, well, I'll go around to all my master's debtors, and I'll reduce their bill, and they'll be my friends, and when I'm unemployed or out of work, uh, they will help me out. And so he did that. He went around to all those that owed his master, cut their bill drastically, and then uh, the Lord says, man, this is a wise guy. He did a wise or shrewd thing. So he commends the wisdom of this steward. Now he's lost. He doesn't have the viewpoint that he should have as a new creature. So he is thinking about how to keep himself uh, solvent when he's un unemployed. So the Lord commends his quick thinking. It commends his desire to be taken care of when he doesn't have the regular uh, income that he's supposed to have. So John Yates says that according to uh, this parable, we can learn several things. And I want you to get this. I, I'm going from the new creature now to a motivator that usually motivates us. The new creature shouldn't have this motivation, but a lot of times new creatures do. And that's why I'm bringing up this motivator. So here's the motivator of money. And this parable on the steward, John Yates should teach us, says this should teach us several things. Number one, he says, we should use temporary, amoral money for eternal purposes in order to win eternal rewards. And I thought that was a good one. 
and the others are good as well. And then he says, according to this parable, we should be faithful in that which is least. And verse 10 says, he that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much. And he that is unjust in the least is unjust also in much. So we ought to be faithful in that which is least, faithful with our money. And then number three, he said, we should be thankful, faithful with our finances given to us in stewardship by God if we expect God to give us true spiritual riches. And I said, boy, that's a tough one. And here's what the verse says. If therefore ye have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to your trust the true riches? <coughs> Brother Yates made the following statement. I'm going to paraphrase it a little bit. He said, if one has not been faithful, and I'm going to put in here, he said money, and I'm going to put in tithes and offerings. And he was including that as well. If one has not been faithful in tithes and offerings, God does not commit to that person more spiritual truth. Now I want you to think back again to our text, <clears throat> back to our thoughts. <clears throat> A person will become stagnant spiritually if they are not faithful with their money. Here's an amazing thing to me. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> Here's an amazing thing to me. It takes a lifetime for us to break out of old patterns and habits. Would to God that this new creature that we are could break out quicker from the old ways. And I think sometimes it takes people almost an entire life to break out of some of these things, especially the motivator of money. <coughs> Although sanctification is a slow, is a process, it should not be that slow. It should not be so prolonged that it seems like there's no change at all. Now, I'm going to tell you something, folks. The new creature ought to be changed and it ought not to take a lifetime for that change to take place. Somebody say amen. Amen. <clears throat> then he says, we must choose between two masters, God or money. Now here's an amazing fact. <coughs> I told you this was unusual. What was so unusual about that illustration? You said, Preacher, nothing. It was to me. Let me tell you why. While I was thinking about this big motivator of money, even in new creatures, I thought about what he said last night. And I said, I'm going to look that up. I know we're in book two. I know we're in the life of Christ. So I reach over <clears throat> off my bookshelf and I get book two. Turn to the, I'm going to turn to the life of Christ. I, I haven't yet. I just got book two out. And as I put book two down to look up that those four points that I just gave you, that he said we ought to learn from that parable of the steward. I set the book down, opened it without looking, and it opened right to those points. First time. I didn't have to turn a page. It opened right to it. You say, preacher, that just is happenstance. How many of you think it's more than happenstance? I believe without a shadow of a doubt that God wanted me to put that in here tonight. And he opened that book right to that spot immediately. That was an amazing fact to me. Remember, before we get off focus now, I'm talking about money and being focused on money instead of, and motivated by money instead of being motivated as a new creature. I want you to get back to the focus of the new creature. I'm not going to spend all the time on the new creature, uh, second, verse 17. I'm not going to spend all the time, but I'm going to really hit it again, especially this on money. We are still focusing on the ministry of reconciliation. Now, here's the point that I'm trying to make. 
when we focus on money, do we focus on reconciliation? No, we don't. You see, the devil, of course, we always blame things on the devil. We could say the flesh, but anything against God that is there, flesh and the devil, they are going to keep us from focusing on the ministry of reconciliation. We are talking about the ministry of reconciliation. And we should stay on that focus. And this focus is that the new creature has a new focus, new views, new motivations, new principles, new plans of life. And things are definitely different. Things are different now. Something happened to me when I gave my heart to Jesus. Somebody say amen. Things are different now. I was changed, it must be, when I gave my heart to him. Things I loved before have passed away. Things I love far more have come to stay. Things are different now. Something happened that day when I gave my heart to him. I'm going to give you another illustration on money <clears throat> before I get on into our text. <clears throat> After I resigned Heritage Baptist Church in Hildebrand, North Carolina, I mean Morganton, North Carolina, after three years of pastoring that church, I spent the next two years drawing what we call half-time or unemployment from the state and every single week I had to apply for jobs and you all know how the process works and so I had to go out and fill out these applications and then go back and pick the check up or get the check in the mail. That was a time those next two years were real tight. We didn't have a whole lot of money. And I decided during those two years as I was filling out applications for employment and we were <clears throat> also pastoring a church uh, we had went to Hildebrand, North Carolina after we resigned Heritage. It took a little bit of time, but anyway, we went, ended up at uh, Faith Baptist in Hildebrand. <clears throat> but anyway, that, that happened a little bit later. We had very little money, and I decided during that time, uh, all that uh, really being stretched financially. Gail was working at the Christian school, taking care of the kids, making sure they were in school, and got proper education and so on. And so she was busy teaching, and I was busy filling out applications and whatever else I could do <clears throat> just to make ends meet. It was not easy. And I decided during that time, I said, I'm going to get a job, and I'm going to make me some money. That's what I decided to do. My focus became making money. That's what my focus became. I didn't have much, and I decided I'd find out how to do it and do it. Some of you have heard a little bit about this, but you don't know all about it, <clears throat> and I won't tell all about it. But finally, I applied at a place, at a mobile home place, and they wanted to hire me as a salesman. Of course, if you know anything about salespeople, most places that have salespeople turn over, have a great turnover, they're always looking for salespeople. So it's not, a, it's not a big deal to be hired to be a salesman. But I was hired to be a salesman. And I was promised so much commission on sales and so on. But the sales were very slow. And so all of a sudden here I'm barely making minimum wage at this place. Still not making any money. And then one day the owner says, if you'll buy in as a partner, says I'll give you a guaranteed salary. It won't be a whole lot, but it'll be better than what you got. I'll give you a guaranteed salary, and then you get your commission on top of that. And so I thought that was a good idea. Didn't pray that much about it. Really didn't talk to my wife that much about it. I just went ahead and borrowed the money that I needed to invest in the partnership. I wish now that that pastor had said that I borrowed the money from yeah, I don't believe you need to do this, but he didn't. He was very kind and very gracious and gave me the money, and I paid him back. So while I worked now as a partner in the business, things began to pick up. And eventually I reached what I considered the pinnacle 
of money making, for me anyway. I finally got my goal of $100,000 a year. I thought that was pretty good. I don't know what you think about it. Some people don't think that's much, but I thought it was pretty good. When you're not making anything, $100,000 a year is pretty good. So I finally, it took years. It didn't happen all of a sudden, but I finally reached it, and I said, man, I've got it made. <clears throat> we didn't have much more than what we already had. It didn't seem to help much that way. But the main thing is that in 1999, I became unemployed again. Won't go through all those circumstances. But the bottom fell out of that market. And when the bottom fell out of that market, there were no sales, none. And I mean, just one every now and then. And when the bottom fell out of the sales, of mobile home sales, uh, people start hitting the road real quick. And I was one of those that hit the road. I was unemployed again. Now, you know what I wish I'd done? Instead of spending part of that $100,000, I wish I had a whole bunch of it in the bank. But I didn't. I just lived like I always lived and spent a lot. But I did have some saved. And if it hadn't been for the sum that it did save, we probably wouldn't have been able to come here. But anyway, to make a long story short, I want to tell you this. My focus changed during those 10 years on making money. And I'll tell you, those 10 years, I regret to this day. I'll never, ever be able to say that was a wise decision. I did what was right. I did what God wanted me to do. Now, I was pastoring a church in Hildebrand, had that little income coming in. I'm now unemployed. I've got their little income, and I make and get some half-time unemployment money. And that's where I was, unemployed, pastoring a small church, getting unemployment when the men from this church came to see us. Say, preacher, you came here just because of money. No, I came here because one day I said in, <clears throat> on the back side of the property of Faith Baptist Church, we had built a nice place back there for a fellowship, and we had a little building and a uh, nice place, beautiful creek. Anyway, I sat down on the picnic table one day, and I said, Lord, whatever you want, I'm back at it. I'm not going to be focused on making, couldn't focus on making money any longer, that's for sure. But the Lord took my focus and changed it. And I want to tell you right now, the new creature is not supposed to have that kind of focus. And many people do. Amen? Amen? Many people do. And I want you to know something. If the Lord does not change your focus to this ministry of reconciliation. Something is bad wrong. Now look at verse 18. We finally get there. Verse 18, and all things are of God. Now notice this. It says in 17, therefore if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature, old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Now it says in the next verse, verse 18, all things are of God. Now what in the world is Paul doing here? Are the all things of verse 18 the same all things of verse 17? And verse 17 means change of views, change of motives, change of plans, change of purposes, and everything is changed now from the old fleshly way to a new spiritual way, from the temporary to the eternal. All things in verse 17. That's one of the things. All those different motives are changed. But then it comes down to this verse that said, but all things are of God. And I said to myself, and I guess you would say too, what in the world is Paul trying to do? And remember, Paul's still a human. Paul's still a preacher. Paul still has, is working for the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul has been a creature that was an old creature. He was in the flesh. He had persecuted the church of God. I mean, in great de uh, uh, um, violence, and great, um, I'm telling you, horror even with Paul's ministry, if you want, call it, Paul's uh, attitude toward the church. But now his ministry is different. Now he's doing something completely different. 
And it would seem that all these things that Paul is doing, he's, he's got the new creature part. He's got the new motives, new plans, new purposes. He's got that. It's in his heart. But Paul has done something with it. Paul hasn't just said, okay, I'm a new creature. So what? No, he's been working zealously. He's been working as hard for Christ as he worked for the devil, so to speak, or for himself or for the Jews before. So now he's zealously doing something for Christ. He's doing all sorts of things. He's preaching in the synagogues, even when they disagree with him. He's traveling immensely across great distances. He's going through all kinds of perils. He's winning people to Christ. He's raising people from the dead, healing people that are sick. And these, all these things Paul is doing, and he's not letting up. He's not backing down. He's completely changed. And here's what I think he's saying here, but all things are of God. He's saying, all the things that I'm doing, it wasn't me. He said, God gave me a new, I'm a new creature in Christ Jesus. He says, I have new motives, new plans, new purposes. And those new motives, new plans, and new purposes, and new views of mankind. He said, all of that has caused a great difference in my activity. My activity is completely different. My actions are different. My deeds are different. And he said, all these things, deeds more than just the uh, motives in the heart. He said, the deeds, I'm thinking, the deeds. All these things, they're not me, it's God. Now, I want you to notice the humility of Paul. But all things are of God. He said, I'm, I'm working myself to the bone, so to speak. And he said, but it's all of God. He said, it's not me, it's not me, it's God. Amen? How many of us sometimes think it's what I do? <clears throat> Paul is making a statement, I believe, about his present life. And I believe that he is saying all of these things about my present life, I am not going to claim. I've done this, I've done this, and I've done... He could have said, look what I've done, look what I've done, look what I've done. If he had done a resume, Paul would have had a list a mile long. Look what I've done. But he said, all things are of God. This new creature will not take credit for what God is doing. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> One thing that sticks out to me in Paul's life is his lack of claim for fame. His lack of claim for fame. He did not have it. He gives God all the credit. It was all of God and none of Paul. We must remember the condescension and humility of the servant's heart. Paul had to reiterate this principle of the servant's heart and the condescension and the humility over and over and over again. Why did he say it over and over again? He wanted everybody to know, it's not me, it's Christ. Listen to these verses in Philippians chapter three, starting with verse three. For we are the circumcision which worship God in the spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law of Pharisee. Concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. But what things, there's those things again, but what things were gained to me? Those I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I cannot, I count all things but loss. For the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things. That's that old things. And do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. 
Paul over and over again is reiterating this condescension and this humility of the servant's heart. He said, and be found in him not having my own righteousness. There it is again. It's not my righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. He said, it's all of God. It's none of me. And then he said that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable, un conformable unto his death. You can either try to know yourself, you can try to know Christ. If you try to know self, you're not going to try to know Christ. If you're going to try to know Christ, you're going to give up self. That's all there is to it. And Paul says, I just, I'll count all these things, but done everything that I've done, everything that I did for the old things, I'm going to count that as done. And all these things that we're talking about in 2 Corinthians 5, all those things are of God. I'm not talking about the old things, but the, these new things of this new creature. He said, that's all of God. He says, I count it all. It's all for Christ. Everything of Christ. Now, all things of this passage in Philippians are clearly the things of flesh. Are the old things of 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Paul counts the old things, the all things of this passage as done. His purpose for doing so is that I may win Christ. Winning Christ. What a phrase. Winning Christ. What is your purpose? What is my purpose? Paul said, mine is to win Christ. That's my purpose. Is that your purpose statement? Is this my purpose statement? I've read a little bit, a little bit not much of those books on purpose-driven church, etc. But I don't know if anybody has written. I, I don't know. It could be in there. Can't speak uh, absolutely on this. But I don't know if I remember hearing them say, when Christ is my purpose. Winning Christ is my purpose. All things are of God, he says in verse 18. Who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. All the new deeds and all the new views, all of that is of God. Everything about this new creature, the views and the deeds, they're all of God. God gave me the views. God gave me the motives. And when I did these things, they're still all of God. Those deeds, those, those uh, views and motives and purposes and plans, and they're all prompted activity. By the way, when a new creature has new views and new plans and new purposes and goals and so on, that has to have activity to go with it. And Paul says the activity that came from those views is all of God. It's not Paul. It is God that worketh in us both to will and to do his good pleasure. To quote Philippians again, chapter 2, verse 13. What else has God done? God has given him uh, these all, all things, all the things that we just talked about. God's given it to him. All things are of God, he says in verse 18. And then he says, God has reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ. It is God who has reconciled us. And since he reconciled us, then all of the ministry of reconciliation is by God and through Jesus Christ. All the ministry of reconciliation is by God through Jesus Christ. God does the reconciling. We are just servants in what God is doing. God is the reconciler. We are not. We have the ministry of reconciliation. But God is the reconciler, and we are not. So number one, God is the one who reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ. Number two, however, lest we think like the Calvinists and that we have nothing to do at all with reconciliation, we are told clearly that we have been given the ministry of reconciliation. I wonder what the Calvinists do with that verse. We have been given the ministry of reconciliation by God. So God reconciles us unto himself by Jesus Christ and then gives us the ministry of reconciliation. He gives that to us. We have it. What is the ministry of reconciliation? So preacher, I, I suppose it's soul winning. 
Well, you've got a good idea. You've got a good start on it. Let's just look at it for just a minute. What is the ministry of reconciliation? To reconcile means to change against anything, to exchange for anything. It means to change one person toward another or to make friends of those who were previously enemies. There are obstacles between God and man of which sin is primary. Man needs to be in agreement with God about his sin. God is willing to be reconciled to any man who will agree with him about his sin. God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance, 1 Peter 3, 9. Man was alienated from God. He had to love. He had man. Man was alienated from God. Man had no love for God. He disliked his government and his laws. He was unwilling to be restrained. He sought his own pleasure. He was proud, vain, self-confident. He was not pleased with the character of God or with his claims or his plans. In like manner, God was displeased with the pride and the sensuality, the rebellion and the haughtiness of man. He was displeased that his law had been violated and that man had cast off his government. Now, reconciliation could take place only when those causes of alienation should be laid aside. <coughs> and when God and man should be brought to harmony, when man should lay aside his love of sin and should be pardoned, and when therefore God could consistently treat him as a friend. Amazing that God could treat anybody as a friend. It sins. But God wants to be our friend. That's what that quote's all about. But he's not going to overlook our sin. There's a problem. There's an obstacle between reconcil being reconciled to God. It's our sin. How can this breach be spanned? Of course, we know it's through Jesus Christ. We know that Jesus Christ, the God-man, took God by the hand, so to speak, and took man by the hand and brought them in harmony. Amazing. But now how did Jesus do that? He did that through the cross of Christ. How many of you ever seen the uh, painting, or at least a copy of it, of Michelangelo's uh, creation of Adam, and it's got the hand stretched out, God's hand stretched out, and man's hand stretched out? Did they ever touch? You never see them touching. <clears throat> Not that I know of. So it had to be something to bridge the gap. And of course we know it's Jesus Christ and his work on the cross. God, the reason that Jesus Christ can do that because he's perfect God, he can take hold of the hand of God because he's perfect God. He can also take hold of the hand of man because he's perfect man. And because he's God man, the only mediator between God and man is the man Christ Jesus. He, because of his death on the cross, can bring the two into harmony. God is the one that does the reconciling, but he does it through Jesus Christ. On God's part, Jesus made it possible for God to pardon man because an atonement had been made and he can, justice is satisfied, he can justify the sinner. And on man's part, he can take away the sin. Even though a man is uh, unwilling, but by the agency of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit comes to an unwilling man and causes them to have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Which, that's amazing. I cannot hardly comprehend all of it. But Jesus Christ says, I take care of this. He says, it is finished. I've done it. I can make it possible. It's possible. And he did it, and we know that. But then what happens to us? We now have this new creature status. We are a new creature. We can't change it. What do we do? God says, I've given you the ministry of reconciliation. God, in verse 18, <clears throat> has done a lot of things. All things are of God. <clears throat> Who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and hath given to us the ministry of reconcil reconciliation. Do you know what this means? You say, well, preacher, I've got this ministry of reconciliation. That's what I've got. I've got this ministry of reconciliation. Yeah, you've got it. I've got it. We both have it. It means, though, that we are to be heralds of this new nature that we have. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new nature. We are to announce to others that we have the new nature. 
and that they can have the new nature, of course. And we are to be heralds of that and confront men, lost men, with the truth that they can be reconciled to God through Jesus Christ. It is a privilege and it is also a responsibility to have this ministry of reconciliation. We think that we just have this ministry and maybe somebody will be reconciled to God through us. Just maybe. It is probably the truth that most Christians never win one person to Christ. But you and I all have this ministry of reconciliation. And it is not just a passive thing. It is active, very active. The Bible says in Luke 14, 23, and I'll read all the passage, but it says, compel them. Compel them. Do you know what compel means? I mean, it is forceful. That is not some lackadaisical invitation. It is forceful. Compel them to come in. Now, I'm going to read the rest of the verse in the chapter. I'm not actually covering those verses, but I'm going to read the rest of them, and I'm going to show you that this being a herald or announcing this reconciliation is not passive. It's very, very active. I want you to get the rest of the verses in the chapter, and I'll give you the thought. Start with verse 19 now. To wit that God was in Christ, reconciled the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. By the way, we need to use the word. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. And by the way, I'm not preaching this tonight, but I'm bringing it up. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ as though God did. Now watch the next words. Beseech you by us. Now that's what I wanted to bring in. Do you know what beseech means? Ask someone urgently and fervently to do something. That's what beseech means. In other words, we are to herald this reconciliation to God. We are announcers of this reconciliation of, of God that God has given to us, this ministry of reconciliation. We are just to boldly proclaim it, but not only to boldly proclaim it, but to urgently and fervently ask people to do something. We be, it says this, listen to this verse. Now then we are ambassadors for Christ as though God did, as though God did beseech you by us. What does that mean? It is if God is in me, beseeching you are the lost person. So if I'm going to fervently and urgently ask you to be involved in the ministry of reconciliation, it is God that is in me saying, beseech them urgently and fervently, ask them to be soul winners. Somebody say amen. Amen. So that means that then not only should I beseech you and God beseech you by us, I ought to go to others and beseech them, urgently and fervently ask them to be reconciled to God. I wonder if we have not taken this great ministry of reconciliation and said, I don't want it. I don't want it. The new creature has it. Has it. What are we going to do with it, including me now? What are we going to do with this ministry of reconciliation? Let's pray.